Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome out to uh, church here on this uh, Wednesday night as we move into Bible study, our midweek Bible study, as we continue to uh, study apologetics as we move into week two of this uh, multi-week uh, study. So good to have you with us tonight, whether you're just glad to be home and off the roads or you're, you're done uh, battling the grocery store for bread and milk. <laughs> you've, done, you've done all that. So it's uh, good to have you back, and uh, we trust that you'll uh, be with us tonight as we move into another important week of uh, how we defend our faith how we uh, discuss not only what we uh, believe, but we understand what we believe. We know what we believe. We know what we know, right? And uh, so that's kind of what apologetics is. And tonight, you're really, I think, going to enjoy tonight's uh, time that we spend together. Because when we get into it tonight, not only will we be looking at what we know, we're going to start off with that, things that we believe, common things that you and I believe as uh, safe people. And then uh, we'll be getting into a couple of great questions this week. And just to kind of give you a little teaser of what those are, uh, one of those questions that we'll be looking at a little later will be how do we know that Christianity is, is the right religion when there are hundreds of them? Uh, so we're going to look at that question tonight. Uh, then we'll also be looking at another interesting question that says, well, what if all these religions are their own paths to the same God? Is it possible that the Muslims and the Christians, for instance, have the same God? Well, we're going to tell you what the answer to that one is tonight, a way that you can respond to that uh, and show you what uh, God's word says. And then the, uh, the last uh, question that we'll be looking at tonight is that, you know, how do you know what you know kind of thing? Now, we're collecting uh, questions. So if you have questions that you'd like to see us add that we're going to be looking at, I, we got a couple last week from Susan. I was talking with a, a good friend from the church this week, got a couple more to add. And then uh, as we get toward that last session, we're going to be answering the questions that come up in your mind that we haven't answered yet. So we're going to keep adding uh, to this. And for the next two or three weeks, I think this is real practical stuff. You know, we spend a lot of time in church, obviously, learning about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and how we worship Him, and why it's important to worship Him, and all these wonderful, wonderful things. But the one thing I think that we, we fail to do a lot of times is, is learn how to put it in practice. How do we put our faith into action? And, and if we're asked about it, how confident are we to give an answer? The Bible tells us to always uh, be ready to give an answer. Now, that doesn't mean always a, a wrong answer answer or our opinions, but what does the Bible say? And, and what, and are we confident enough uh, to share what we believe and what's going on? So that's what these sessions are about. Um, it's a little different for our Bible study. Typically, I just like to teach, as you know, line upon line, precept upon precept, take a scripture and go line by line and word by word, because uh, I think it's great for us to really understand what God's word is saying. Uh, but, but I thought it would be a little change up to discuss apologetics and we'll spend four or five weeks on this topic and then we'll go back into some study and then maybe revisit this because we're never in four or five weeks going to be able to come up with all the answers uh, that you're going to get. But my goal is, is that we'll have uh, some of the very common questions um, that are often asked of us. Last week, we talked about why would a loving God send people to hell? That was a, a great discussion. That was a, it was a, it was an interesting comment. You know, that was one of the questions uh, that we addressed last week. If you missed that and you want to learn about that, go back and watch the, uh, the previous, uh, the, the, the broadcast from last Last week and uh, you can catch up on that but we talked about that we spent a lot of time talking about why we defend our faith there's some people who would say that you don't need to defend your faith because we have faith I don't have to defend it but I think that's just not true we learned uh, last week as, as we went through a lot of data in our country to show that there are more and more people searching for answers and searching for truth and there are so many different religions out there. Somebody's going to grab a hold of one of them. And we want them to grab a hold of Christianity because we know it's, it's the right way to heaven. It's the right way to God. And um, so, so we wanted to, to really get into that. So we, if you go back, if you missed last week's session, you're going to see a lot of PowerPoint slides that come up on your screen um, that will walk you through this, a lot of scripture. And, and actually, it may be a little much um, because I even went back and was looking at some of it. And it was a lot of information uh, to process all at once one time or certainly retain. So today we're going to slow it down. We won't have as many slides for you to, to watch, but we want to keep it moving. And again, our goal is not to be talking on a level that's over all of our heads, because if we can't use what we discuss, then it's not going to help anybody. We want real practical examples that we can use 
in our conversations uh, with people, what I always like to say in our friend circle, which that's the people we come in contact with daily. So that's our plan for tonight's session. Again, we're so glad uh, to have you with us and we trust that you'll just hang in there over the next hour as we look into God's word together. The, like I said, these are some, some really good things that we're gonna be going through tonight and love to have your feedback on some of these issues. Uh, feel free to chime in on the comments as we go along. If something jumps out at you, something uh, you know pops out in your mind of, of something that's interesting to you, that's how we learn from it. That's how we can uh, grow in our faith and grow in our knowledge. Because at the end of the day, we need to be able to say what we believe or why we believe. Because people may genuinely be searching for that. This is not Bible study for uh, debate. It's not Bible study for argument. It's not for that. It's not so we can be right. It's so that at the end of the day, we can point people to Christ. That is the main goal at the end of the day. So I want to just uh, talk about a couple of uh, names we have on our prayer bulletin here at the church and a couple of things going on at the church that we want to tell you about. And we want to invite you to get involved um, uh, in if you if you so wish. Uh, we continue to pray for uh, the Blackhurst family and the Stevenson family, both continuing uh, after the loss of uh, loved ones. We continue to pray for uh, Connie Reynolds. Keep her in your prayers. You know, Connie had her hip replaced and now we'll be looking at a knee replacement soon. And uh, that's always a a tough recovery and uh, and I think I think Connie's the mayor of Meat House Road if I think I'm right on that and uh, but uh, and the keeper of the goats right Connie uh, but we're glad to have you uh, with us uh, today and, and and our prayers are with you that you'll uh, be better and she's had a lot on her plate you know with the passing of her sister and then the, the, this surgery and then the next one that she'll have to have so be in prayer for her we continue to pray for Barb Stagg a lot of you know Barb uh, from here of course member of the church and and uh, Barb was in the hospital there for a while she She's out, I believe, or she's back into the hospital. Uh, so keep her in your prayers as they continue uh, to, to look for some treatments for her. Uh, Damon Sampson, continue to pray for Damon. I always refer to him as Ann's good friend. Uh, come to church here a lot uh, with Ann and just a, a real blessing. A young fella just as a, a, is, is a great guy all the way around, but he's having a, a bone a marrow transplant. And I know that that started uh, this past weekend. Uh, so be in prayer for him that his recovery will go well. Uh, the family of uh, Jim, Jim Rutan, be in, be in prayer for them. Uh, you know, Jim, I believe it was his wife. Was it his wife, uh, Susan? I think it was. Yeah. His, his wife passed away. Uh, so we want to, and her name was Joyce. Um, and I know that they're connected to Wayne Fridley, who's a member of our church. So be in prayer uh, for them. And a couple of others, uh, Beth McCarthy, we, she's on our list. We continue to pray for her and Katie uh, Steedman. Um, and, and of course, all the names. They're, they're all so important to God uh, that's on our prayer bulletin. And in our church, we have a, a prayer uh, ministry card list and, and a prayer bulletin that we have that we pray for. So if you, if you know somebody who you'd like to have added to our prayer list, just call the church here. Let Miss Susan know. She'll be glad to take care of it. We can put them on there. If somebody needs to come off the prayer list, we can do that. Uh, but it, it really is a way that we can lift up these needs to God. We do try and pray for these people regularly, not only in our services, but in our own prayer time as well. So um, if you're on there, we're, we're praying for you and we're trusting God that, that he will be with you in your specific situation. Anybody here? Uh, Kathy, Gary, you all have any names you want to add? Any other prayer requests that you all have? Okay. Praise the Lord. Wow. Very nice. So uh, Kathy with the double praise tonight, uh, thanking God for uh, the, the work he's doing with Beth McCarthy. She had a lung transplant. I mentioned her name. Kathy said she's doing well. We praise the Lord for that. And her granddaughter, who's a, the, a living miracle herself, uh, Evie Saylor. Uh, we remember her and uh, it's her one year anniversary from her. That's hard to believe it's been a year. I mean, I, it was a very scary time. She was born, her esophagus was not connected to her stomach through a lot of prayer, a, a lot of, I believe God just reaching down and touching and uh, healing her uh, through the time. And now look at her. You'd never know she ever had a problem. What a story that she'll have uh, one of these days. And I know the family already does on how good uh, God's been. Gary, you have anything you want to, anything tonight for you? We'd be in prayer for you. Uh, Gary's had kind of a rough go of it last uh, couple weeks. Uh, so be in prayer for uh, him. But he, he's looking about as good as Gary can look. I mean, let's just be honest. He, he's, he's, 
<laughs> He's back. Uh, and uh, Kevin? Thank you, brother. He's going to pray for me, and uh, I'm still recovering from a procedure I had done, so uh, we're, we're getting there, and uh, we're, we're glad to be here, and uh, it's, always, it's always good to have my church family uh, praying for me, so uh, thank you for that. Um, so th let's go to the Lord. Let's pray for all these folks. I, I want to pray for you at home. Um, however, you may be watching, maybe you're purposely watching today, maybe you're totally bored or you're tired of COVID or tired of winter and you just want to tune in. Well, we're glad to have you with us uh, tonight. And I want to pray for you and your family that not only you're warm tonight, but that you're healthy and that God is blessing you where you are. And uh, we certainly want you a part of our church family. And if this is how we have to meet with you uh, for the time being, we're glad to have you could be doing it. You'd be watching Matlock reruns. Come on now. And uh, you're watching a Bible study here on Wednesday night. So I want to pray for you uh, tonight as well. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the many blessings of life that you give us. And Lord, uh, where would we be without you? Where would we be without you? God, you're so good to us, even when we're not worthy. Even when we disappoint you, you still love us. Even when we fail you, you still love us. God, uh, we really, truly don't deserve all the goodness that you give it, give us. But Lord, I know that we're all so grateful and honored that you considered us worthy enough to send your son Jesus to go to the cross for our sins. And for that, we should be forever grateful. Father, thank you for allowing us to be able to be here tonight. Lord, as a, as a small group this evening in the church, and Lord, for those watching tonight or those that will watch this on archive. You know, we know a lot of people will go back and watch this over the course of time. And Lord, we just pray that it's no accident that the folks tune in tonight, Lord, to learn about faith, to learn about what we believe and why we believe. And Lord, uh, most importantly, how you've changed our lives. And Lord, you can change others' lives. Lord, we just pray that your blessing be upon the church, be upon every family in our church. Lord, for every family that's watching tonight, Lord, for that person that's just secretly, quietly watching off to themselves tonight, Lord, I thank you for them. And Lord, if they have a need tonight, I pray that you'll meet it. Lord, if they have a question tonight regarding their faith, Lord, I pray that you'll meet that as well. Father, send your spirit so that we can bask in it tonight and know that we've been to church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple of uh, quick things uh, on the uh, bulletin just to tell you about for church, um, just to kind of catch you up to speed in case you missed Sunday morning. Um, we are uh, turning in our uh, Sanctity of Life uh, bottles that we've been collecting. So if you still have yours, you can still bring those in this week or next week, and we'll get those uh, shipped out as well. Um, the Deacons and Finance Committee meeting was scheduled to meet Monday and Tuesday. Both those meetings were pushed back till next week. Um, so they'll be meeting then. And uh, also, I want to just thank uh, Joe Hendricks a little bit. Joe's leading up the 18 to 35 group, and I know they went and had a, a real special Valentine's dinner for our uh, young adults in the church. And uh, they just had a wonderful time last week, and I'd like to just thank her. Uh, for her uh, being involved with them. I uh, thank Ann tonight. I know she's got the youngsters out tonight, and uh, we just pray that, uh, that God will bless them in all that they do. We did have to move the uh, movie night uh, the other night um, with the weather bad, so we had to postpone that. We'll reschedule a little later. And the other thing is, is if you have kids that are interested in signing up for the uh, children's rally, the children's spring rally, you know, the church will send your kids, so you, it won't cost you anything. Uh, but we're not exactly sure how they're going to do that logistically this year, but we want to get our kids involved in that if we can. It's something they typically do at Parchment Valley. Um, they may do a combination in person or online. We're not sure yet. I think they're still working on some of those decisions. But it is so great uh, to watch those kids worship together and the activities that they have planned. But I think they even get a T-shirt. It's a lot of fun. So if you have little kids, these are for the little kids around kindergarten age. If you have that age group and uh, with you or grandkids uh, and you're in our church, please reach out to Susan, let her know as soon as you can, or Talia, let her know so we can get your kids signed up so that they can get ready for that. March seems like a long way away, but it's not. You know, we're only just over a month away from East, from, from uh, Palm Sunday. Can you believe that? It's just a little over a month away, and we're going to be into the Easter season. So, uh, you got something, Suze? Okay, so if, if you have any of the kids going to go to the children's rally, try and let Miss Susan know before, uh, before the end of the weekend. Okay, so anytime this week, even if you're thinking about it, go ahead and let her know so she can get your name on that list as soon as we can. Okay?
Any any other announcements? Have I missed anything? Circle meets tomorrow, seven. Women's circle is supposed to meet tomorrow, seven o'clock here at the church. I think it's covered dish, so bring something good, and they'll share. I might bring my wig. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying. I'm thinking about it. Uh, they always have good food when they when they gather together. Any other things we have? All right, so that's what you have. We want to encourage you to work and uh, join us for worship. 1045 on Sunday morning. We're here in person or you can watch it online. We'd love to have you be a part of our church service. OK, so we're into apologetics. And um, so what is apologetics? Apologetics is, is how we defend our faith. It is how we defend something. It's to argue something. The definition actually talks about it's, it's how we argue. But as a Christian, we don't need to argue our faith. We, we do need at times to defend it, though. We need to be able to give an answer when somebody wants to know what you believe or why you believe. In our church here at First Baptist, we've had many discussions of Bible study that always seem to come out with the topic of I'd like to learn more about how to do that. I'd like to be able to explain how I feel or what I believe better. So that's something we've been thinking about uh, over the last year anyway, and that uh, we had hoped to have everybody back in the church so we could actually break into some small groups and actually practice evangelism and stuff like that. That would be fun to do, and, and maybe we'll still be able to do that. But, but this is a, a great opportunity to take a break from the traditional studies we've been doing. And what we're doing is we're using a couple of um, great items. And one, I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you about to begin with up front. There's a great book. Uh, it's by Charlie Campbell. I left it on my desk back there. It's just a little book. It's not much bigger than a bulletin, but you know, maybe maybe has a hundred pages in it, if that. And uh, the name of the book is called One Minute Answers to Skeptics, Concise Responses to the Top 50 Objections and Questions. And obviously, you know, we're not going to go through all those. You need to get the book if you want to see them all. But what we're going to do is we've pulled a couple out of each out of the book for each week that we're going to share their input. And what's really cool about the way Charlie does his book is they're very simple, straight to the point applications. Like we talked about last week with that question of why would a loving God send people to hell? That was we had to start with that one. Right. And like I said, if you missed that, go back, watch last week's and you'll get it. But you remember his answer was very simple and uh, it was very very simple and it was very direct so not only do we have the scripture to back up you know that God doesn't want any of us to perish he wants us to have everlasting life you and I know the Bible but for someone who doesn't know the Bible or who already is trying to doubt the Bible how else can we reel them into the conversation and again we aren't out to prove anything we're out to point them to Christ and that allows the Holy Spirit to work in their life. So we are in apologetics week two, and this would be our slide A, uh, learning to defend our faith. And, uh, and again, the, the aim of this whole study will be to get us to the point to where if somebody asks you what you believe or why you believe, you feel comfortable about sharing that. And then we're talking about a few of those questions that always seem to come up uh, because we're Christians. And don't worry, we'll get to the hypocrite question. We'll get to the myth questions. We'll get to all those and your questions that you've had. Like I said, we've started a list. I think we have six questions on the list that you all have shared with me. And that we're going to be adding those a little later on into our class. So let's look at the first let's look at this uh, slide uh, 1b this, this is interesting this is just a very simple circle of what do we believe as Christians so you might be watching today you could be here today hopefully if you're here today you're a Christian um, but if you're watching and you're not you're you're wondering well what do Christians believe you know what's the what's the cornerstone of what we believe and I made a and we're going to look at this little chart here in a minute uh, that you can see and um, we're going to go through a couple of those boxes and again it's not to overwhelm you with information is to give you what the Bible says about a few of those points. It's very important and why we believe it, because then we're going to look at three of those questions that we talked about in the beginning that creep up. How do we know Christianity is the right religion? How do we know that the that the Hindu uh, that the Hindus aren't right? How do we know that the Muslims and the Christians aren't serving the same God? You know, how do we know that when people ask that we get the deer in the headlight look because we don't know how to respond. So through apologetics, we get to reason together to reason together on some answers that work. Now, are they foolproof answers? Probably not. I don't think there is 100% absolute in anything. For a lot of, we have absolute confidence in God, but for the skeptic, 
they're not absolute people. You know, they're quick to condemn, but what we found out last week, they often condemn because they just don't know. And that's their go-to plan. So uh, one of the things that you and I want to know is not only what, what the, uh, the skeptic believes, but what about some of the other religions? What about like, you know, no offense to them, and, and if, if that's where you practice, and any of these I, I mentioned tonight, I'm certainly not here to put down what you believe. I'm just here to tell you what we believe. But if, if you're a Mormon, if you're Jehovah Witness, they come to your home and want to share with you what they believe. What do they believe? How is it different than what you believe? Do you know what that difference is? Um, and, and, and there's a good chance you probably don't. So hopefully, through the course of the study that we have planned for you here in this series, you're going to learn what they believe, but you're going to know what you believe. And it's very important. You don't have to defend somebody else's religion, but you should be able to defend your relationship that you have with Christ. Okay? We want you to know what you know, and because you know. All right? And uh, so here we go. So here's some simple bullets that I put together. These are just, these are kind of like if we had a creed. We, we don't really have a creed, but if we had one, what do we believe? What, what are some of the things that we believe? First, we believe in God, right? Which God? There are many gods, the little G's in the universe. There's, there's, there's hundreds of religions, hundreds of different religions, and they all say God. And, and everybody uses the word God bless you, and that doesn't offend anybody because everybody has a God. You know, even, even, the, even the demons know who God is, right? So what, who's the God that we worship? We believe in God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, that, that's, that's who we believe. The, 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 the name is Yahweh. You know, that, that's, who, that's who we serve. He's a triune God. What does that mean? He's, he's, he's God in three parts, or God in three uh, sections, if you will, for lack of a better word. Kind of one office that does three different things. It's one position. And, and we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But they're, they're all the same God. You say, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. You know, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. But we believe this. I want to tell you what we believe, and then we'll go back and give you the fuel that you'll be able to say what you believe. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe he lived a sinless life, who died on the cross for our sins, and that he was buried in a tomb, and three days later, God raised him from the dead, and we believe he's alive today. That's what we believe in Jesus. We believe that salvation, being saved, that's, that's the word you hear a lot of times in church, we believe being saved. What, what is salvation? What is being saved? What is that? Being saved means is that we've given our life to Christ. He is our Savior. We believe that every person ever born, other than the Lord himself, is born in sin. That means we are born into sin. You didn't have to do anything but be born. So if you were born, you have sin. That's the way that works. To get rid of that sin, to be back in relationship with God, we need a Savior. We needed a sacrifice for our sins, and that was Jesus Christ. And because he was sinless, he was that perfect sacrifice. We'll talk more about this a little later. These are Now, if you're watching and you're like, brother, this is elementary church 101. It is. But see, we have to know this because if somebody asks you, you may not think of these things. But this is the very nuts and bolts of where we're going to go today because you'll see these questions get really hard. They get really hard because people don't ask you to give the 101 version. They want to go, you know, chapter 22 of Revelation, right? They want to go way deep right off the bat and try and throw you over the edge. We believe in baptism, right? We believe in baptism by immersion, but baptism does not bring salvation. Baptism comes after salvation. So what does that mean? We believe that baptism is a testimony of our salvation. It's symbolic of being buried with Jesus when we're placed underwater. And then when we come out of the water, it's symbolic of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. That's what a believer's baptism is. We, you know, we believe that you're saved when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, to forgive you of your sins. That simple prayer, it's the free gift of God. You don't have to do anything to earn it. You just simply ask for it. And when you ask for it and repent and believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, the Bible says that we're saved. Our first act when we get saved should be to show people that we're saved, to demonstrate that we're a changed person. And we do that by baptism. 
and, uh, and, and being part of a Baptist church, we believe in baptism by immersion, placed underwater. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. He's our example, and we want to follow him into the footsteps of baptism. We believe in communion. We celebrate communion all the time. Communion does not make you holy. It does not take away your sin. Communion doesn't do that. When we celebrate communion, we believe we commune with the Lord. We do it in remembrance of, of the last supper he spent with, with his disciples. The last time he was gathered with them, they were eating the Passover meal. There's their celebration meal. And Jesus began to teach them and he had bread and, and he had wine, which was which was staples at that kind of meal. And he gave thanks over the bread and he broke and they passed it out. And, and he, he told them that this was symbolic of his body that would be broken for them. You know, that it would be that, that and we know that the Bible tells us he's the bread of life. For instance, we know that manna, that's what it was called, that came from heaven, sustained uh, the children of Israel in the desert. We know that Jesus, he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And they, they ate the bread. Now, remember, Jesus was with them, so they probably didn't understand that at the time. But we know later, Paul reminded us that we're to celebrate communion often. But he not only did he have the bread, he had a cup. They had wine. That's what they drank then. And we'll get to the alcoholic beverage thing at a later date. But, but they had wine. They had wine at the meal, another staple for this meal. And he took the cup and he gave thanks for it, passed it out to the disciples, and he told them that this was the blood of the new covenant and that they should drink this for the remission of their sins, that, they would, that, that this represented the, the new blood, this new testament, the new way, and his sacrifice that was coming on the cross that they knew nothing about. But he's telling them that you'll do this in remembrance of me. He even tells them, I'll not drink wine again until I'm in heaven. And then he said, you may drink the cup. And they would drink. So churches, believers in Christ, celebrate baptism if their salvation. They get baptized to show they're saved. And then they celebrate communion because they're saved. Communion is a way that we commune with God to celebrate and to remember not only his death and his burial and resurrection, but also his return to come for the church. And uh, I hope this is making, I mean, I know, I'm, I know this is element, this is Sunday school stuff. So if you've been on the way for a long way, you're sitting there clipping your fingernails and you're like, come on, brother. Come on, really? I'm missing Matlock for this. Listen, this is important that you understand what we believe. These are basics in our faith that are so important because people will take these and they'll take them out of context to try and ask you some hard questions about it to try and trip you up. So that's that's that. We, what about our salvation? What about our salvation? Well, our church, and, and some churches differ in this, but we believe in what's called eternal security. Eternal security. This means that when you're saved, you cannot lose your salvation. God doesn't ever leave us. We choose to leave him. And that's, that's the most important thing that you need to know in your walk with Christ. If you're saved, you're saved. Now, this is a controversy for churches who aren't Baptists. In fact, some will say, I can't be a Baptist because I don't believe that. But we're going to show you in the course of apologetics how you can explain what eternal security is, why it's not wrong, and why you should be proud of it, and why you should claim it, and why you should help others see it. Because we believe in Christ there is no condemnation. However, eternal security is not a license to sin. It doesn't give us the opportunity to go out and party it up and live like the devil on Saturday and come and preach the message on Sunday. It doesn't give us the right to do that because Christians, true born again Christians would never want to purposely or willfully sin to bring dishonor to Christ. So we're going to talk about that again. It's a misconception. You may have church friends who aren't Baptist who, who, who throw that at you like that makes you a lesser Christian because you believe in eternal security. And it may actually make you start to feel that way because, because somebody may strongly disagree with that. So you need to know why we believe that, why the church believes that. And most importantly, it's something that you should be grateful for. Eternal security is something that as a believer in Christ, you should be able to live your best life now. Not, not in a sinful way, but to be the best you that you can be because when we live our best life for Christ, we do the most good together. We serve in missions. We support missions. We volunteer in our community. We serve in our community. We give to important causes. We help our brothers and sisters in need. 
and we don't persecute those Christians who fall. Why? We go and help them up. We give them a hand up. We give them a hand up, not a handout, but a hand up to get back on their feet again. Some churches, the old, the old uh, quote goes that Christians are the only people who, the only people who shoot their wounded. You know, when they're down or out, they just pile it on. We don't want to be like that as believers. We want people to see that being a Christian means that we can have life in the way Jesus says more abundantly, that we can enjoy our life, that we can get through life together. And part of that is we don't have to worry that we can do something accidentally and lose our salvation. We can do something not deliberately and lose our salvation. We have to move beyond that. But there are some people who worry every single day that, they're, that they won't do what that God wants them to do because they may fail and may fear that they'll lose their salvation. And, and that's a tough place to be in. And we'll talk about that. I'm not saying people who believe that are necessarily wrong. I may not agree with their stance on the doctrine, but if it keeps them close to God, then I'm okay with it. But I want you to see what we believe in eternal security is something you should be proud of and you should be ready to give a defense for in case you're ever questioned. Because, it, because we have life in Christ and salvation that's, um, that's something we should be very happy with. And last but not least, we need to know that the Bible is God's holy word. We don't need to be afraid or ashamed of the Bible. We need to quit worrying that we have to say, well, it's in the Bible like that's not good enough. We know the Bible is God's holy word. It's his spoken word to mankind, perfect to help us not only know how to live, but to how to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. So one of the things that we have to do, you and me both, we have to make sure that we're not afraid of the gospel of Christ. We're not afraid of the Bible because it is life. It's life changing. It's changed my life. It's probably changed your life. It's probably changed your family's lives. And so part of apologetics is understanding that we have the word of God right here. That's complete. Anything and everything we need to know is here. Nothing will be added to it. Nothing will be taken from it. This is it. Salvation is forever settled. Aren't you glad? We live in a time where the goalpost is constantly moving with life. What's acceptable? What's not acceptable? What's permitted? What's not permitted? Things you, you know, the Washington Redskins used to be an okay football team name. Now it's not. Times are changing. The culture is changing. This doesn't change. It's God's word. And, and we have it. It's the greatest gift beyond Jesus that God has given us. Because this shows us that we can be with him and him with us. And we can have eternal life. Well, that sounded like a good sermon, didn't it? But that's basics. That's the basics of Christianity 101. That's the simple stuff. Now, we could go a lot further than that. But those are the things that you may get questioned about more than anything else. More than the how do you know, do you know. But those, that's, that's the basics. And that we're going to look in on some of these specifics here in a moment. The first one that you can see in the box here on this screen, on this slide. This is a slide 1B. You can see that, um, that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit... Are one we we people are so confused about this one there's a couple of examples that you can use when somebody says I don't understand how you can serve God but you know then you have the Holy Spirit and then you have Jesus I mean who's God here who's God it's God right because Jesus is his son so he's below him and then the Holy Spirit has to be below Jesus so we've got we've got our own little hierarchy of how things work well can I tell you that they're that they're equal because it's God it's one God it's the same God in manifest in three parts and and you say brother that makes no sense to me well how can you defend it if it makes no sense to you there's three great examples you can use one let's start with the shamrock it's saint patrick's day is coming up and, and you know the the three leaf clover right that that's the most that's the easiest shamrock to find it's it's one clover with three leaves now is it three clovers with three leaves no it's one clover with three leaves. It's one God with in three parts. Let's do another one. How about the hard boiled egg? Now, I know you've had a hard boiled egg. I love hard boiled eggs. You have the outer shell, you have the soft white, and you have the yolk. Is that three eggs? Are they three? They're three parts and they're all three different. They all look different, they feel different, and they have different roles. Sometimes if you're cooking you'll use the egg white. Sometimes you might use the yolk. Sometimes you'll discard the shell. But a hard-boiled egg, you'll probably use all three parts. And guess what? It's still an egg. 
That, that outer shell serves a part, it protects the egg. Then you have the white, the second layer. Then you have the yolk in the very middle. middle. It's all still an egg. That's an easy example to use. Another that you can use is, a, is ice. I-C-E, ice. What is ice? Is ice water or is ice vapor? What is ice? What is it? If you freeze water, what happens to it? It becomes ice. If you boil that ice, what happens? It becomes steam. It evaporates. Is it water? Is it ice? Is it vapor? What is it? You can use a cube of ice as an example to demonstrate that the three different properties of that are all the same. So while we have God the Father, who is the creator of all, then we have Jesus, who was God in flesh on earth, who dwelt among us. And then we have the Holy Spirit, God in spirit, who lives in us as believers, that comes into our life when we ask Jesus to come into our life and to forgive us of our sins. That's when you get the Holy Spirit right then. That's when, that's when the Spirit of God moves in you and begins to work through your conscience, work through your heart to kind of motivate you in different ways. Let me pause here and see if anybody in the church wants to add something first to talking about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Anybody have any feedback? I can share. No? Okay, hearing none, we'll just keep right on. How about on the phone? Let me see if anybody on the uh, thing. Well, like I said, it, it's a toughie because people want to put God in a box. We want to believe that, you know, God just sits there, you know, looking down from the throne. That's all he does. You know, Jesus was here and he's sitting right beside, you know, they're, they're high-fiving each other and, you know, whatever. But they all, it's, it's one God. It's one God who manifests in, in three ways and they're all equal. Genesis 1-1 tells us that God has always been. That's the other thing. Which came first? You know, the universe or God? You know, which, which came first? The stars or God? Which came first? The planet or God? Which, which came first? God is the creator of the universe who has eternally existed in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all co-equal, making one God. Genesis 1-1, very first verse in your Bible. Any Bible that you have, if it's a holy Bible, the first verse tells us who God is. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. That's who did it, in the beginning. Well, in the beginning was the Word. We know that from John. The book of John tells us. What else? In verse 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals. Let us make man in whose image? My image? What's he say? Our image. Our image. Why our image? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Lord God said, this man has now become like one of us, one of us, knowing good and evil. God knows good and evil. Jesus knew good and evil. The Holy Spirit knows good and evil. Psalm 92 says, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Everything came from him. Matthew 28, 19 tells us in the Great Commission that we're to go and make disciples, that's followers of Christ, in all nations, in all countries, in all areas, baptizing them, how? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. In 1 Peter, verse 2, chapter 1, 2 says this, We've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctifying worth of the Spirit, to the obedience of Jesus Christ sprinkled with his blood. Again, pointing out Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So it's hard for us because we don't see you know, me as being the, the pastor and, and the deacon and the cook in the church. They, they don't, we don't see me that way. But, but what we, we, we have to look at God as, as he, is, he is all three. He is, he is all three, but he's one. And, and, you know, this makes Christianity set apart from any other, any other religion out there. They have multiple gods. We're just, you know, this, this is one God. One God who manifests himself in this way. Any thoughts? about God, Jesus, 
in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Son of God, co-equal with the Father and Holy Spirit, who lived a sinless life, offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Matthew 1, and 23 said this, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. You say, well, why is, why is that important? That's a, that's a Christmas story. Listen, Jesus wasn't born like me and you. He was born of a virgin. He wasn't conceived by human man and human woman. God placed him in the belly of a woman who had never had intercourse. And because of that, Jesus was holy. He was perfect. He was different than us. And you will, he will, they will uh, give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child is born to us, given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. I told you about John chapter 1, one of my favorite uh, chapters in the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, that Jesus was there from the very beginning. He was the Word. He was with God, and He's with Him there. Through all through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. A couple of other scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 8 says, For what I received, I passed on to you as the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and raised the third day according to the scripture, and he appeared... And he appeared to not only the disciples, but to Peter. And after that, more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time. There were witness accounts of Jesus. There's historical information of Jesus. There were eyewitnesses not only to him who was crucified, but people who saw him after he raised from the dead. And you say, well, that's only 500 people. Listen, in that day and time, that was a lot of people. 500 was a lot of witnesses who remember had heard no doubt of this man who was beaten, carrying his own cross, crucified, and now alive. Acts 1, 9, 11 said, After this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them saying, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Listen, that same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. That same Jesus, that same Jesus who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, who healed the sick, who healed the lame, who raised the dead, now was crucified, buried, and rose again, and now has ascended unto the Father. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, again, equal with the Father and Son, presented into the world to make men aware of their needs for Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to make us know that we need Him, to live in every Christian from the moment of salvation, providing the Christian with power for living, understanding the spiritual truth, in guidance, this author said, of what's doing right. The Christian wants to live under the control of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we don't know what's best for us. Our prayer is that the Holy Spirit, how many of you prayed this? Will lead, guide, and direct me. Will tell me where I need to go. Will tell me what I need to do. Sandy says, exciting. Thank you, Sandy. This is so true. And again, I, I feel like we're, we're in college and this is a Christianity 101. But I'm telling you, when it comes time to telling somebody who knows nothing about the Bible, we need to have a foundation that we understand. And sometimes it's just good for us to know why we believe what we believe. But you can see the God, the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit all one. And of course, the Bible is God's word. The Bible is God's word to all of mankind, used by human authors who, under the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit, wrote the word of God. Because it was inspired by God, it's truth without error. It, there's no error in the Bible. I was reading some examples, and, and one of these will come up in one of our questions, about contradictions in the Bible. The skeptics ask about the contradictions in the Bible. And they use an example of Jericho. Kevin, you'll like this. They were talking about uh, Jericho. There was an old Jericho and a new Jericho in the Bible. 
and how one was talking about he had went into Jericho and the other said he was going out of Jericho. That's a, but they said one was referring to the old Jericho and one was referring to the new, which were about a mile apart. And so when you think about it, we're quick to say, well, was he going in or was he going out? Without an understanding of historical context, it looks like a contradiction. But in fact, guess what? They were going in or out of Jericho, depending on which Jericho you're talking about. So time after time, the Bible, you know, we, we're quick to want to try and find something. You Google it, find a contradiction. But many of those so-called contradictions have explanations, but we don't take the time to see it because if we're looking to try and disprove something, that's all we care about. So we want to make sure that when we're talking about the Bible, we see what the Word of God says. And you know, they, I believe God knew that there would be people to doubt His Word, that they would doubt this book. You know, and 2 Timothy 3.16, that's an easy one to remember. Because think of John 3.16, everybody knows that scripture. If you can just remember 2 Timothy 3.16, John 3, 6, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness. Verse 17, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's an easy way to remember. We can remember, we can remember John 3.16. If we can just make that 2 Timothy 3.16, we can say that this is what the Word of God is for. So when somebody says, well, I don't, that Bible is just written, it's an old book, it's an old history book. Well, listen, that, that's a life-changing book. And what does it say? I'm looking at you guys as I'm saying, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this. That's how you defend your faith. Because see, when you're passionate about it, when you believe what you know, and you're excited about what you know, you don't have to argue that. And they say, well, but you're quoting the Bible. It's because it's God's word to me. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, Above all else, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was guiding them to write in the way that God would have them to write. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, What you've heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith, and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Psalms 119 tells us that the Word of God is a, is a lamp for our feet that does what? It lights our path. Want to know how the way to go? Want to know how to get there? Psalm 119, 160. Boy, it's hard to believe there's 160 verses in there. 119, 160 says this, All your words are true. All your righteous Laws are eternal. Proverbs 35. I love this one. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. Those are powerful scriptures about the word of God. And it's in the word of God where we learn about salvation. That's why on the chart that you saw, what we believe, Bible and salvation are together. And we know that faith comes by hearing the word of God. But the Bible assures us of our salvation. So we're going to move on uh, and get to our three questions, but we're going to come back to this a little next week and, and talk a little more about Bible and salvation and baptism and communion. It's very important that we do that. So let me move over here to uh, question number two, uh, slide number two. And, and here's the question that Charlie Campbell says that is, 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 is question 10 in his book. Sandy told me she was going to buy his book. Sandy, did you get his book yet? I think it's only, it might be 10 or 15 bucks. I don't know if it's even that much. You can get it on christianbook.com, I think, or Amazon. I think I got mine from Christian Book. But um, anyway, number uh, 10 in there is this question. It says, with hundreds of religions in the world, it would be impossible to investigate all of them and know which one is true. Now imagine somebody saying that to you. What is your response? What would it be, Gary, if that was the question posed to you? What, what do you do when somebody says there's hundreds? We know there's hundreds. We agree with that. So what do we do if there are hundreds of religions in the world? You know, is it impossible to investigate them all? What does Charlie say? Charlie says the answer to someone who argues this question is really, do you really want to know which one is true? I, I, love, I love that they flip a question back. And you know, Jesus did that. How many times did Jesus answer a question with a question? Because we know what we believe. 
But if someone's asking, are they asking to trip you up or asking to argue, or are they searching? We can't see the heart. We can hear their, their infliction and their voice. We can, we can believe that we know, but we don't know. We're not God. So we have to treat every question as if someone is gen generally searching. And our goal is to point everybody to Christ. Every, every answer has got to point to Christ because we don't know everything. But Christ, the Holy Spirit, God does. Okay? So the answer to someone is this. The author proposes that you approach religion, when approached like this, as to a coffee pot. I love this. As to a coffee pot. It says if you were going to buy a new coffee maker tonight, you're going to buy a new coffee maker tonight, how would you buy it? What would you do, right? If, if, if Kathy, you're going to go home and you've decided you're going to have a new coffee pot, and a new coffee maker, which one do you buy? Is it a recommendation of somebody else? Is it one you've tried before? Are you going to go look at the reviews? What's going on in your mind? You're going to investigate. Are you going to investigate every coffee pot before you make the decision, before you buy it? I love the way that Charlie says this because it makes a lot of sense. See, this is how you use reason with a skeptic who's already dismissing the Bible. Because, of course, if we were buying a coffee pot, we wouldn't go try them all out. We wouldn't go read about every single coffee pot, you know, that was made. We, it would be impossible to do that. He says, the best guess is that you would probably read the reviews. You'd probably look for the most popular one that's used, read a few reviews. And uh, if the bestseller was free, would you even search any further? If, isn't this good? Am I the only one that thinks this is good stuff here? Kevin, I love this. This is good stuff here. Get a little happy. Because if that good, if that coffee pot with all these reviews, if it was free, would you even keep on looking? Chances are you wouldn't, he said. He said, with religion, why waste your time? This is the answer. Why would you want to waste your time researching the little ones where there are very few followers? Because the truth is obviously not there for many reasons. You would simply start with the major religions that have a large following. And maybe you want to start with one that has 2 billion people following it right now. There's your reviews. 2 billion people are following Christianity. And this religion offers you, right? What this religion offers you is freedom from sin, forgiveness of sin for free. Costs you nothing but your faith. And he says, you can also tell them if you want to read about it, go to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which tells the story of our Savior. And he even says, they said, well, I don't, I don't even have a Bible. I don't, I don't even believe the Bible. And he said, well, then you can offer up two other books. One is called The Case for Christ, and the other is called The Case for Faith. Both of these books written by Lee Strobel. I think I'm saying that right. Is it Lee Strobel? I, I, I didn't write the names down. I think it's Lee Strobel, who was an atheist who found faith. Watch him wrestle with the same questions or concerns you have and see what brought him to faith. You don't have to believe me. Take a look at him. See how that, how would that change? Just that one, we wouldn't know. How, with, let me read that question again. With hundreds of religions in the world, it would be impossible to investigate them all to know which one's true. Somebody said that to you. Before you freeze like a deer in the head, like now you're going to think coffee pot. You got this. You got this. Then you're going to say, if you want to read more, you can read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you can say, then, you know, somebody, if, they're, if they're still pushing, well, they're, they're, I know there's a book by Lee Strobel. There's two of them, Case for Faith and the, uh, what, was it, what was the second one called? Case for Christ, an atheist who came to faith, trying to disprove faith, came to faith. So he would probably have the same questions you have. Go search it up. But I would start with the big ones first. And then guess what? What have you done? This, this is where I get all excited. You have pointed them back to Christ. You have put them on their journey. Now they can argue and continue to argue and then you realize it's not really about anything. But what if that person was genuinely searching? Then you pointed them in the right direction. Number three, next slide, next question. The only reason you believe in Christianity is because you live in the West and were brought up Christian. If you lived in India, India, you'd be a Hindu. What about that one? What about that complaint? Well, the response 
according to this author, says this. He says, so the only reason I'm a Christian is because I live here? Do you think the only reason I'm a Christian is because I live in the United States? He says, you think I haven't investigated what I believe? The birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do you think atheists are atheists because their parents were atheists and can't think for themselves? Of course not. He said, influence can have impact on us, but it doesn't have to undermine the legitimacy of the truthfulness of Christianity. Oh, this was so good. He said, one thing to do, he said, one thing you could do is ask one of the 24 million Indians who have converted to Christianity why they switched. He said, you'd be better to start with them, to ask them, why aren't you a Hindu like everybody else? So, I mean, see, again, it's not, it's not looking to argue. It's pointing people toward Christians, toward a witness, toward Christ. We can do this. You and I can be powerful evangelists for Christ. You say, brother, I'm not meant to be an evangelist. Listen, I know that you're smiling saying, I can do this. And you can do it with a serious look on your face. You don't have to do it with, with, with a bad heart or that you want to argue. You don't have to do it that way. Now, the last one, I saved it for the last one because I really thought this was awesome. And, and this one is about the same God. Have you heard, and I know I have, this is a slidey, Christians worship the same God as Muslims. All these religions all worship the same God, there's just different ways to them. Have you heard that? You all heard that at home? I've heard that a lot, my whole life. And I'll be honest with you, I've never really had much of a good answer for it. But I'll tell you, using our Islamic friends as an example, uh, it, it will help. Now, I want to preface this because I have Islamic friends and, and I have people of different faiths. I'm not here to judge how you believe. I'm not here to do that. This class and this, this, this apologetics course is, is to point people toward Christ, to show you what we believe. But there is a key difference in the Islamic faith and the Christian faith when it comes to God. And here are some of them. Do Christians worship the same God as Muslims? And here's what it says. Here's what Charlie, Charlie writes in his book. Number one, he says Muslims worship Allah. Christians worship Yahweh. Muhammad said Allah was triune, was not triune. Yahweh is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that, that's, that's an immediate difference right now, isn't it? Can we just stop there? We could. We could just stop with that. Because that is a big difference in Christian faith and the Islamic faith. The Islamic faith says that Jesus was not the Son of God. The Bible says Jesus was the Son of God. See a difference? Triune, monolithic, right? Then you have, then you have this with Jesus. The Islamic faith says that Jesus did not die on the cross. The Bible said he did as well as others in that day, including Flavius Josephus, who was the Jewish historian of the day, who was responsible for keeping all the historical records that Jesus was crucified. The Islam religion says that God does not love sinners. Jesus said, Father loves all people, including sinners. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not die, but have everlasting life. The Islamic, the Islamic faith says that good works have to outweigh the bad works to make it to paradise. Christianity says that everlasting life is available to all by faith in Jesus alone. Are you seeing differences here? See, this looks like a really hard question, but if we know what we know, and we know what somebody else believes, we know there's no comparison here. Now, can I tell you there's a few more? The Islamic religion believes that the only way to, for sure to enter heaven is to die in jihad for their God. For Christians, our belief is that Jesus, who is God in flesh, died for all so that we all would be able to get to heaven through faith. The Islamic faith says their God came about 600 years after Jesus was born. The God of the Bible says that, that our God came along to man 2,700 years earlier when he spoke to Abraham. 
But we also know, what did we learn about God? He was there in the beginning. He always has existed. So there are clear differences in what the Christian believes than what those of the Islamic or Muslim faith believes. Both are good people. See, apologetics isn't about finding bad people or good people or arguing with people for the sake of arguing. It's about what, what's our responsibility? To appoint people to Christ and why you believe what you believe. Because see, somebody who was trying to convert you to their faith, they would tell you everything I read on the other side of the page. That's the way it is. They wouldn't listen to you. And a lot of times when we have the people going door to door, knocking on your door to tell you, to visit with you and, and to share things with you. It, it's not to find out what you believe. It's to share what we believe and why you should believe the way we do. Boy, if we could be as bold, if we could be as bold in our faith. See, some people are quick to put those other religions down um, or denominations down. I'm not so much because I wish I was as good as they were at witnessing. I wish I was as good as they were at evangelism. And I wish our church I mean, the church, our church, was as good as going door to door, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and him crucified and him raised again as much. Guys, we are out of time for tonight. Was that cool or what? I, I've enjoyed myself. These questions are awesome. Again, let me let me give a, a selfless plug here for this book. It's not my book. I love it, though. And uh, again, there is um, 50 of these kind of skeptical questions in there. They're one minute answers to the skeptic. We're every every uh, service for the four or five weeks that we're doing this. Um, we'll throw out a couple, three like we did tonight um, that kind of fit into the lesson. But all that doesn't matter if we don't know what we believe. We need to know that we serve one God. We need to know that Jesus is the Son of God. We need to know, you know, that, that what we believe is what we believe and why we believe it. If we do that, our faith is going to be stronger. And you know what? We're already saved, but it's going to make us a better Christian. It's going to make us a better, more informed Christian. So um, with that said, we're going to close it out for tonight. Listen, if you have questions, you want me to add it to the list. Let's see. So far, here's some of the questions I know off the top of my head that I have. We've started a list. Number one is... The Bible has some similar stories to Greek mythology. How do we know what's in the Bible is true? Okay. And we're even going to look at one example. Horus is one uh, from, from an Egyptian God that people often say is, is it's just, that's Jesus in, in our Bible. They think that's not true. We'll, we'll show you one example of that and explain that. So that, that's one. We had another one that said, what about the gifts of the spirit? Did the gifts of spirits like speaking in tongues or healings, those kinds, did they cease to exist after the apostles? Do the people really do that? That was a question. The other question is, is what about prayers not answered? You say God hears you. You say that if two will, will touch and agree, it'll be done. Well, what if it's not done? Is the Bible a liar? Is God a liar? Those are tough questions. But you know what? There are questions that people may wonder about. And you may get asked. And when you do, what is your answer? And if we're truthful and we're mature enough to be honest, we probably don't have a very good answer. Because we haven't thought about it. So we're going to think about some of those kind of questions. If you have one, let Susan know, call her, text me, private message me. We'll add it to the list. There's no bad questions. This is all about growing stronger in our faith, being ready to, to give an answer when we're asked in season or out of season. And my goal for the last class or the last session that we have, whether that's in week five or six, depending on how this goes, we want to talk about how you lead somebody to Christ. Boy, I would love to have 50 people online and 50 people in the church that want to know how to lead somebody to Christ. Because what if I'm not available? What if your pastor's not available? What if your Sunday school leader's not available? What if you're not available and somebody asks you, I think I want to get saved, and you say, well, let me give you a couple numbers and call one of these. Why don't you do it? Why don't you do it right then? You say, well, I, I would if I could, or I might be scared. Well, what if we can make it so simple by using the alphabet? to lead somebody to Christ. Very simple. We can do that. We're going to teach that together. We're going to learn that. And, uh, and my goal at First Baptist is that one day, everybody who comes to our church, if they were honest, could raise their hand and say, I know how to lead somebody to Christ. I may not be comfortable doing it, but I know how to do it. And uh, that's what we want to get to. Because then God can use us in a powerful way. We know it's his will that people not perish but have everlasting life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you tonight. Boy, what a good time to together uh, this evening. Lord, I've enjoyed myself. 
Um, this is so good. I mean, this, this is so good. We could be here all night talking about these things. And Lord, if, if we could just, you know, hear from everybody all at the same time about their examples or their experiences, there's probably other questions that popped up in people's minds that they've heard, uh, even, even from people that just wanted to argue or fight, but questions all over the place of what we believe. God, give us confidence in our faith. Give us its excitement to learn about our faith, to know what we believe and how to give an answer to these questions that often catch us off guard. Lord, we want to do what your word says, and that's be ready to always give an answer that may lead somebody toward faith. God, help us have a desire to take a deep breath when somebody asks us a question and, and to process it through the Holy Spirit of how to point them back to Christ. And Father, these great examples that we're using here from this little book, I pray this guy gets on the bestseller book tomorrow uh, just because these are so simple, but yet it really does click when we look at it from the eyes of a skeptic. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for those uh, watching tonight. Thank you for those who brave the weather to be here this evening. We pray a blessing upon them. God, keep us safe till we can return on Sunday morning at 1045. Until then, may God bless you as our prayer. Amen.